thank you everyone for tuning in and i think uh, <clears throat> for being with us for the past sessions and this session as well i am nalin goel vp of product moengage been in thick and thin with moengage for past 5 years uh moengage is a intelligent customer engagement platform uh which uh, aims to personalize each and every interaction that the users are having the business is having with its users so uh without further ado i'll probably delve into the session today which is as i say uh, in god we all trust but all others should bring the data and today we are going to talk about the data driven approach to the product onboarding so joining me here today are three esteemed panelists and before we kick start the session i'll just uh, give a brief intro about them and then probably will they can talk in their own words so first i would like to welcome prashant singh prashant has won multiple hats in the past ranging from founding a few startups to client servicing from partnerships to product and i guess he is a journalist and specialist probably at the same time prashant over to you to introduce yourself briefly yeah hi everybody and thanks for engage for inviting me to this meetup i've been attending the previous session also it was pretty informative uh, i've been a product guy and mobile app guy all my life studied computer science uh, in college uh, started a company a couple of years back Uh, in ai domain and then uh, we had an exit to paytm worked in paytm for roughly 4 years a lot of learnings over there and before that i was running working with a app company where we had a portfolio of roughly 20 app got 50 million plus download half a million to like 1.25 million unique per day in page views and also a uh, lot of learning a lot of fun starts so hopefully something of value i can contribute here today uh that that's awesome prashant uh, next i would like to welcome shavan and shavan hill from this beautiful city of jammu and currently is working at byju and a lot of us probably follow him uh, for his quirky and probably honest takes on pms uh, why has pm stories on linkedin and i think as ready uh, mentioned in the initial session that he is also uh, found found of the community called the product tree Shravan, over to you to introduce also briefly. Thank you very much, Nalin, and looking forward for this amazing panel. And thank you very much for calling me over, uh, just from from Moengate side. Uh, a little bit about me: uh, the last five and a half years have been in product, been a product guy all my life. Have worked across, have been fortunate to work across multiple companies in different spaces. Started my journey with Flipkart. Work with a, then moving to a logistics startup called Blackbird, which is a billion dollar enterprise now. Uh, worked there as their third data PM. Worked with the Times Group for a while, where I worked across multiple portfolio companies. Sometimes with Mag uh, a, a little bit of time with Magic Bricks, sometimes with Dineout. Uh, the last three years have been specifically in tech, and that's where I found my love for building education products. Uh, the last stint that I had was a parallel to Coursera called uh, Edureka. I did Rika and I was working there as a senior man, a senior product manager for search and personalization. Eventually, ended up leading the business, and finally, around nine to ten months back, I joined by Juice as a lead PM, where I lead specifically take care of the new product, Shahrukh Khan wala product uh, called by Juice by Juice classes. So yeah, little bit about me. Thank you very much. Yeah, over to you. Thanks a lot for uh, this introduction, Shravan. Joining us next is Siddharth Arora. Siddharth is currently working with Razor Pay and has worked extensively, I think, in US before. focusing on indian ecosystem so sudat over to you to introduce yourself briefly great thank thanks nalin and and i like the introduction stravan that sharukh khan wala product was nice <laughs> uh, so just a little bit about me uh, you know work with this company called razor pay i hope uh, you know all of you you know panelists as well as you know folks in the crowd know about the company uh, we essentially are a are a payments platform um, joined the company about uh, a little bit more than 3 and a half years ago right so when the company was fairly still uh, early stages and now uh you know uh, you know i think now the company is the i think the i, I believe the 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 40th unicorn of the country i believe uh been on about 400 worldwide right so uh, essentially you know attain the title um and uh, what i manage at razor pay is what we call payment apps so on top of our payment gateway product right we build a, a suite of apps essentially with uh, you know uh, two very fundamental goals right that if you really want to be the number one player not in just in terms of the billion dollars we progress process on a regular basis right but it even comes to the number of merchants we touch right so we need to essentially solve for more use cases in depth and in also create you know uh, segment wise and industry wise use cases right so i manage that suite uh, essentially you know that that suite contributes to about a good 25% of the company's uh, 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 you know uh, revenue now um and uh, prior to resetpay was working this company called quicker i managed their quicker jobs portfolio uh, for a couple of years so that and that was a very interesting take that was actually my 
first stint in india right because prior to that i was in us for about 10 years right so quicker was a very interesting uh, was it was a very interesting journey and you know was able to you know work my first i think hands on experience on a very consumer traffic heavy product so uh, you know re- really exciting stuff and you know learned a lot uh, last company was in product management and you know thanks mo engage and alin for inviting me for this fantastic session i think sudar pleasure is all ours thank you everyone for your kind introduction and uh, i without further ado i'll delve into the session i think we all have probably heard that first impression is the last impression and uh, for any product if we talk in general onboarding is that first impression so want to know from all of you that how important is this first impression and how it basically uh, reflects back on the relationship of the user or the consumer with the brand how does the seamless onboarding actually impacts your engagement or retention metrics since we are talking in terms of data for the past few sessions so i think any any one of you can take it first uh, so uh, i would ideally want to start so uh, onboarding it's a very interesting question by the way first of all nalin onboarding for us specifically at byju where we have a consortium of products we necessarily just don't have one product which is the live learning product which i kind of manage uh, onboarding for us is not necessarily just somebody logging into our app or any of our platforms it it takes a step forward that is he doing the intended action that we desire him to do on the app like for byju's classes it might be booking a trial class for the btla the byju's learning app it might be doing a learn journey for a user and specifically for the english learning app it can be just doing an assessment so how do you drive the user specifically to that one part without enough commit without any commitment in between so that he can discover the value before even actually having the value of the product delivered to him the use cases are diverse right but at the very functionally how we look at from a product management st- uh, standpoint or from a product manager standpoint are the three first principles that i keep talking about all the time the first is how do you make the onboarding flow so commitmentless that the user never feels so so distraught that oh i have to give my details i have to do all of this even before he experiences the product the second part is how do you make the journey so contextual that while going through going through that journey he understands oh this is what i'm going to get oh this is the kind of content that i'm going to get or this is the kind of doubt resolution i'm going to get and the third and the most critical piece that is how do you navigate between a sea of products that you have specifically as an ecosystem that these three parts kind of make the onboarding structure in such a such a seamless way that functionally a user before even he enters into the byju's classes ecosystem understands these are the three value prop that byju talks about one is great great quality teaching second is probably the best out resolution and the third is instant instant gratification in terms of getting the high quality content and stuff like that what we have seen is we do experiments all the time we do exp- well as i am speaking almost like 30 odd experiments would be happening right now as i am speaking with you guys so for us it has been very seamless like If, if we have built such a the onboarding structure has been so seamless for us that we have seen like 30 40% improvements in the first action which is just booking a trial class and simultaneously it has a trickle down effect that if you fundamentally understand this is what i'm going to get then there is a possibility that you want to come back again and we have seen retention metrics go over 2x 2x on our core base by doing small nudges and the last thing that i would keep talking about is that from a vision standpoint there might be some sort of glorified vision that you want to pursue but for a user it's just the small dx chunks that you keep doing like there's a small contextual nudge that comes in and that kind of compounds into a great onboarding experience yeah and that was very insightful and right on point i guess yeah Cool. So I'll go ahead and I'll add, uh, you know, my bit as well. So in addition to what uh, you know, Shravan mentioned, right? Uh, uh, so the the way the way we the way we look at payments, right? I think uh, generally, and I think payments now probably more so now, right? It's 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 a it's a coming to a fairly commoditized space, right? So I think there is there are a fair number of players, uh, you know, not just you know uh, you know you know Indian players, but even you know global players who are entering to the market as well, right? So uh, generally, you know, the 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 challenge we're looking to solve is how do we you know provide that instant gratification right and uh, uh, you know the first step is you know how do we not make it you know troublesome for the merchant to acquire uh, you know to you know and be on one payments right and essentially that was a problem that we started with when the company started and we want to just you know adhere to that mission that you know if you want to let's say accept payments then you know you should not take more more than a couple of minutes right and the moment then the moment you take more than more than a couple of minutes right it's you know it's absolutely criminal because you know you've spent you know this massive marketing dollars to acquire them 
uh, run a lot of seo campaigns sem campaigns and what not right so marketing team is you know putting their you know that blood sweat and soul acquiring campaigns and you know because of you know poor onboarding you just lost the consumer because you know you making you made him wait for you know half an hour one hour maybe maybe sometimes even a couple of days and he says keep sorry boss uh, you know uh, and the very and the reason why we think like that because we think that at least uh, i would say majority of merchants come to payments when they really need it at the moment right it's not a, it's a, it's more of an afterthought rather than you know rather than a more of a planned activity you know i need payments right the fact oh, oh god i need payments right now our customers coming can i just get a gateway right so considering this is more of an afterthought right we need to ensure that the onboarding is seamless right um, and you know and we tried obviously you know as stavan also mentioned we tried obviously uh, multiple experiments we track you know a lot of metrics to ensure that uh, you know our onboarding funnel is as clear as possible and uh, there is a, a dedicated team uh, you know whose okr is just to ensure that you know that uh, we know that the onboarding funnel is moving weekends nights holidays you know whatever and whatever right and also there is um, you know uh, um, interesting campaigns running in uh, across the in, interesting uh, you know trends uh, you know coming up right so uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, you know if you look at uh, uh, you know with the moment you know covid happened right the entire you know focus went on contactless payments right so we just jumped on that campaign because we knew that you know this was a great way to acquire more users and onboard more users right so we keep on try to you know look at you know multiple factors and uh, the and the core bit of it lies in data right so you know uh, you know we have you know really good strong pms you know in the company thankfully uh, where data is almost like almost like muscle memory right so if we have a good firm grip on that i think uh, you know you'll be able to pep and we, we i think to a certain extent i think we've cracked your problem i think still a long way to go uh, but definitely much better position to we are in very about 3 4 years ago awesome siddharth uh i think very valid point in terms of that what exactly is the context of the user and when are they coming with that intent to your platform i think that defines a lot of the onboarding experience for any company or any brand prashant would you like to add something to this yeah i mean uh, both of the speaker prior to me they made some very valid and very contextually relevant point but uh, i would like to in addition to that i would like to add a thing about uh, uh, more often than not we tend to look at activation or like onboarding as a more of a one time activity with a bunch of like uh, tool tips and bunch of uh, notifications and emails coming along and then a little bit of hand holding and all what if we bit, but if we take a step back and if we look at the data you learn that it's more about life cycle management user life cycle management and you have to say okay you know this is my activation threshold so if i'm facebook Uh, it's a co- very widely quoted thing that if you get them seven friend in ten days and get them uploaded uh, two photographs, uh, chances are the fly will will keep running and they will keep coming back and all. You can have a similar keystone for your own product, like you can say, okay, you know, if I am uh, razor pay, if somebody uh, kind of choose my gateway versus let's say Paytm's gateway or some other's gateway twice, then it's working out. If I'm um by zoo so on and so forth you know so uh, that require a fairly good understanding on data so you can say okay this is my uh, cohort of the people who kind of stayed there is no science to it in the sense there is science but there is no definitive science to it you can you can't start with the assumption and say okay you know this is the ba- behavior i want to cultivate you should be humble enough to admit that okay i don't know i will just look at the people who worked out well for me i look at my cohort of engage user and do a regression back that okay i have seen all the people who come back on day 30 day 7 and all and i look at what are the common characteristics they have it may be a simple thing that tier 2 city iphone user on wifi are the one who basically the most engaged user for me if i am a video streaming app for example that kind of gives you a more tangible insight to it so basically you should have you need to basically look at Uh, into uh, this thing the whole onboarding piece as a life cycle management and another uh, biggest thing is like again coming back to the point of humility you should know that okay once i am zero to like uh, 5 million app um, user base app to 5 200 and let's say 100 plus million app and the kind of user who will be coming will be different so you should have a very customized and different onboardings and uh, so basically the onboarding which uh, somebody in a tier 3 city coming from on because you don't have any data about this guy so you have to basically assign it to some random cohort like you know and how 
predictive that cohort can be is critical so it's different so one good thing is essentially you should the wealth of information available if somebody looks for it so uh, one exercise i used to ask my team to do always was go sign up in facebook from a fresh id and you will see the whole on first 3 days 10 days experience is not different it's not very similar to what you who has been using it for past 7 years gets yours has been fine tuned to you but you should look what is the new cohort of people they are applying those uh, tactics to it's eye opening it means every 6 month you should basically sign up your regular apps facebook twitter youtube and see how they input or just log into youtube through cognito mode and you will realize the onboarding thing completely agree i think that's a very interesting point that you've made that onboarding first thing is that onboarding is not a one time goal and yeah. because any i think in the in the such a dynamic market where nothing is constant your user persona probably that you analyze some 7 days or 20 days back is completely changing now right or probably after a month or after 9 months your user persona has completely changed the needs have changed so onboarding experience yeah. need to be certainly changed yeah. you cannot put it in stone completely agree with that point on uh, on point there is a lot of uh, industry specific variants also so if you are a saas person towards the end of ltv the nudges which you will send to the person will be different versus in the beginning so mm-hmm. there has to be that humility and self awareness a lot I, of time we start with a fixed idea that, that's a, that's a required skill for every product manager that you cannot always say hey i know this because there is always so much to learn you cannot make any assumptions because you have to go out and explore then only probably you will learn yeah. so i think you made a very interesting point in the starting prashant where you talked about that hey uh something like a value action right like say for facebook it is like hey how much time the user is coming back on the feed right or probably for uh, e-commerce it is like giving the transaction or probably for by user it was like hey doing the class right mm-hmm. but i think uh, this onboarding basically tries to take user to that milestone and different companies track different milestones in terms of that for onboarding some people break it down into smaller milestones like mm-hmm. hey this is my sign up or this is my login or whatever it is right and then some companies actually keep the activation as the milestone of onboarding so would you guys want to kind of touch a bit on that that hey what are the kind what is your thought on this that in your specific brands that you are managing the products for uh, what are the key milestones that you track and probably share your thoughts on that sure uh, so i would go ahead on this narin so i think funnel analytics with the quality of feedback is like the holy grail for any pm mm-hmm. how do you look at your funnel but every funnel has certain vision metrics that an every pm has to track for like how the business quantifies itself in terms of value to the user like for me it might be just how do i bring more and more people and they can easily navigate and book a free trial class for me so how many people are effectively going and booking up a class from coming up from the acquisition funnel the second part could be that specifically that that's really important for by users how many people out of the people who have registered have actually attended that class because that is when they actually see the value of the product but in the interim as prashant mentioned there's a complete life cycle that takes place right what are the nudges that happened okay he entered the class how, how for how much time did he stay in the class then were her doubts actually solved or not so every vision metric kind of breaks down into some leading le- uh, leading or lagging metrics right one of the leading metrics that is very relevant for us in byju's is that we specifically call out that byju's classes is a platform that that provides instant doubt resolution and it's from the best teachers in india is the doubt resolution percentage even good or not so how you tie those metrics in those fundamental life cycles towards your vision metrics is something that is really really critical for us for something like for somebody like byju's the aha moment is the okay if a user really comes in and he really spent 70% of the time in the class he, he has the 70% watch time percentage in the class so then i know functionally that he has ascertained the value of the user uh, value of the product and now i would want functionally there will be ha- there will two things that will happen one if he has attended 70% there's a good chance that he'll come back by himself so there is a nascent intent and the second part is that he's actually interested in the value proposition of the product he has really understood that so data from a very functional standpoint trickles down like a tree for us like the three parts for a particular product and eventually tying down to the core kpis of the business that how do you grow the business in itself organically how do you get a great nps around it but then again that kind of 
when i when i talk about all of those things is the one of the things that the pm has to really really keep into mind is that all of the things that is tracking are they really aligned to the one core or the two core focus areas of the of the company that they want to kind of work for so uh, going forward uh, the the way the point that i'm trying to probably mention is that there is no one single key and what you have to functionally understand is that all of the, all of these metrics tie tied together in a complete journey where you want to take a person from a to b but not losing the context of the core vision that we have in terms of the functional metrics that you want to drive for your product yeah got it prashant any thoughts on that from your point of view i mean yeah <laughs> i mean it's something which cannot be disputed I means yeah functional and vision metrics are important but see, the thing is the devil is always in nuance so essentially let's say you have a um, business basically essentially saying it's a very fancy and verbose way of saying that business sets the kpi and you have to basically deliver on that and the problem is how what are the tools and tactics at your disposal to uh, attain that goal so now imagine this scenario that you are not meeting those goals a simple thing like you know your goal is to basically sell shoes on a shopping transaction based platform any of e-commerce site can be an example for that and now uh, you are getting on the top of the funnel you are getting a half a million user per day and conversion is not healthy so, and now there are ways to trick user by persuading them to buy there are way to buy user to essentially offering them more discount and things like that then there are ways to basically do better targeting you know where you throw the ball back to the business say you know what i'm getting all these people into the funnel on the top of the funnel but i think you need to find you in your targeting and according to my cohort analysis the people with this targeting are actually getting more conversion Correct. you know and then that's so basically uh, vision statement and all is good but you have to basically see uh, holistically you know right. so, you know okay i will inherit something how much of the top of the funnel is also kind of fine tuned otherwise you basically all the friction you see downstream comes from the fact that you always try to work with the same data like in ai also you have this thing that you have to clean the data first before you kind of ingest it you know so somewhat similar thing needs to be done in product decision making also yeah. that's the caveat otherwise like totally in sync with the other gentleman cool so i'll go ahead uh, you know and i'll add my points right so talking about uh, you know the 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 aha moment right i think that's like the is like the favorite word for most all pmt how do i get that aha moment Uh, so uh, it, it, uh, a lot of that so you know in trade you know so uh, you know obviously there are you know a lot of data points that pm can look at right i think there's obviously you know uh, there's a plethora of data you can look at on a daily weekly monthly basis right so um, at resepay you know one of the interesting trends that uh, that we observed right uh, and we realized that uh, a lot of i mean you know customers also sign up at resepay uh, you know as a merchant to acquire the product right they actually have already used raise pay payment gateway in some partner platform right be it to let's say purchase flight tickets or be it to you know purchase groceries or uh, there are there n number of partners for you know for various initiatives right so uh, you know we realized that you know how do we get them to experience the product right because uh, you know in terms of in terms of if you look at payments right it's hard to kind of really define the value prop until you experience it right it's not a it's not an innovation that we have in the market right payments is here to stay and uh, like i said it's it's now getting to be crowded space and i'm sure there'll be like you know 10 more players you know you know you know that will come in the next couple of years as well right uh, so one interesting experiment that uh, that we did right that actually you know really helped us walk the magic of experience right that uh, you know we already have customers signed up they're already into the funnel right how do we get them to experience the power of the product right so interesting thing we said great thanks for signing up by the way you know you be have already you know sent your payment link why don't you experience this payment link experience and then see how you know you know how the process works we have the email with the phone number right so the customers goes ahead you know and uh, uh, you know and tries to make a 10 rupee payment the other thing he notices that oh by the way i have I, this is a 10 rupee payment but you know raise pay has already figured out they know what is my preferred upi handle and the card number because we were pick up the fact that what was the preferred upi handle card number when he was let's say using you know you, you know using the grofers platform to pay for groceries because we have the, we have the data available right so he saw the magic that you know what is able to relate to me and the payment happened 
and in a couple of seconds he got a confirmation and then let's say you know rajesh said great thanks for making the payment i hope you love the product by the way i've already bought, i've already gone ahead and issued your refund and the refund hits is in the refund hits his bank account in a couple of seconds right so basically in a without having the customer to even make anything we were able to not just to experience the end to end journey right because we had the data available right and you know and that small experiment you know uh, was the aha moment for us to basically kind of really bump that funnel right because we we saw the fact that you know payments you know there's no drop off right you know that drop off can actually make or break an experience for payment almost everybody right even folks like you and i right uh, you know who probably made online payments at least a couple times a day on an average right and if and refunds the other leg like, right where if you don't get refund on time you know while a smaller tick while small tickets are you not care but larger ticket size you know it can even bother you for the matter even if it's like the biggest boys in the country right so we wanted to get the customer experience him work ki while you know i can obviously tell you ki you know this is how payments can work this are thing but for them to experience the product first hand you know can really make or break the make, make or make experience right so that was the aha moment for us uh, where we get them to actually uh, experience the end to end product And and a lot of that you know took over time, right? Because you know we looked at you know multiple cuts, pivots, slices, dices in terms of you know what's the on you know what's the funnel like, what's the source of traffic like, uh, you know how you know at what point we realize that you know the the if they've cross if they've crossed this threshold, uh, the churn metrics actually you know is is going on the positive side, and the CLTV is increasing, and the fact that they're able to be able to you know acquire more products per merchant, right? so a lot of indicators obviously you know you know comes into play right but some of these very simple aspects right you know uh, we simple experiments right and a lot of these things typically are experiments that you run right it's not something that you have like you know this crazy vision i'll do this will work right you obviously uh, run multiple experiments you know i typically i think you run about 100 100 experiments i'm sure 95 will actually fail only 5 will actually go through and with the 5 you have to then fine tune them right so again that's the you know Uh, that's how i think typically uh, you know we figured out some of the aha moments to help us uh, you know get to that threshold that you know i think now i've got the user hooked now i have to now keep him engaged so that you know i don't have in you know, a competitors acquire my customer sure i think uh, that that's very fair point in terms of i think that's a good campaign which is basically focusing on all the key value propositions that you probably are putting forward as a payment gateway or as a payment processor in terms of that hey i am what i am largely doing is that i am improving your success rate and probably then secondary i am improving the time to refund to your customer which is probably in turn going to give a great experience and i think yeah i think that com- i completely agree that it can come only from when you kind of go back and understand like it should come only from my insight about that customer problem that hey this is a customer problem worth talking about probably so i think uh, that that's a that's a uh, takes me to my next follow up question on this that when you say that this campaign worked really well right and probably this insight was actually the key value proposition for as a pg right but say for other products or where else have you seen that how do you drive those kind of insights i think prashant touched upon this point initially that facebook uh, came back initially saying that hey seven uh, friends in 10 days is something that will keep you engaged right so how do you as a product manager go and create these insights for your own product and what are the say tools at your disposal probably or what are the key metrics that you focus on while doing such kind of analysis best is uh, i mean is the, mathematically this is called regression analysis you look at the 30 day 20 day mm-hmm. or like one week cohort of the people and see these are the people who are sticking with this uh, um, with my product and what are the common journey uh, steps in the journey they have so you can basically map it back to say okay you know these are the kind of people and what are the in terms of their profiling what is the common facts minimum common set of attribute i can say you know uh, uh, which can be assigned to them and that's how you get a set of user and set of action item that okay if i target 18 to 32 year old man in tier 2 Uh, with the android and ios phone and then make them to buy a shoes or a i don't know deodorant then this is the my demographic and then i'll see adjacency of course it's kind of get complicated as you have more offerings and more flows and also but uh, that's the high order bit regression mostly so 
I think adding to what Prashant said in very fair point, I think it is very similar. We start from the marketing metrics that what's the source of traffic, where are people coming from? And then the functional part within the product is how you look at product analytics metrics. Like if a user has come, has he taken that one intended action that, that can be specifically booking a class that can be going inside the class and uh, actually answering a poll question or not? Was the question interactive enough for him? So if you tie the journey from pre-class, I'm just talking in context of Baiju's like, pre-class, in-class, and post-class metrics, and you tie them together and try to see that cohort, how that cohort has scaled over time, how that's scaled, either horizontally or vertically in, in, a, in a particular duration of time, and try to gather insights from there. That, oh, if this particular user, if, if we find that 80% of the users had 10 doubts and all of them got resolved in the session, there's a greater chance that that particular cohort has like 50% higher retention than any other cohort. And then you figure out, oh, doubt resolution is one of the metrics that we need, really needed to solve for. And you put more teachers there, you build better systems for that to solve that. Similarly, it can be oh, specific if 10 people interacted with the poll questions that we are pushing out in the product. And all of them were really happy with the feedback that they got. And this particular cohort has a typical higher retention in, in consuming the learn journeys that I have, or specifically the content around the free class. That if these people, if there are more people who actually do assessments with us, how does that cohort specifically behave? And you try to derive an insight from there. And then you try to optimize those systems in such a way so that the value kind of come out, comes out by itself. Like uh, what Siddharth talked about, something like a very interesting use case that he talked about that the UPI handle automatically figured out that in, in the gateway that this is the preferred UPI handle. Similarly, can we figure out that this is the preferred content This from the concept that you wanted to learn? This is the next assessment that you should do. And if you do that assessment, that's an aha moment for that particular user and or for that particular cohort. Yeah, completely in sync with Prashant on that particular point, yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. Would you like to add something to this. Absolutely right. I think uh, you know. I think uh, you know. In addition to that, right. In addition to that, uh, what uh, you know, interesting uh, you know element that you know we've started practicing at Razorpay, right. Obviously, you know, you know, you obviously will look at your attention funnel. You know, you can look at 30, 90, 120 day, and you know, you'll try to do various you know slices, dices, right. And a lot, and typically a lot of that retention funnel actually, uh, at least what I, at least what I used to practice earlier, and you know that one element that we brought in actually, actually we've seen a make big difference. Is typically you look at the source of the traffic. You know what is the source of traffic, where they came from. You know the, what are the how long it take for them to you know get that first nudge at at Razorpay. Uh, you know how many products over time they have acquired, right? In uh, that interesting element, we have added. Um, to that funnel is actually our that uh, our support experience, right? That you know that the from the moment let's say they've raised a support ticket, right? What was that experience and what is the CSAT score, right? With and that element actually sometimes makes a huge difference because again uh, and the reason we add that because we feel it's it's financial, right? Finances, uh, you know, in the country we live in can be very sensitive, right? Uh, right and uh, you know you, you have to equally treat a ten rupee payment versus a ten lakh rupee payment, right? Uh, because you have you don't know the background the individual comes with right so you treat that with add that much care so um, that element uh, you know gives you a lot of insights that you know what how was the support experience of the customer right so when you add let's say the the quantum support tickets they raised or uh, you know the tat it took to close the support ticket or the csat score and you and you see that experience over and over right um, and uh, you know could that support ticket you know could have been answered faster so while while we got the answer but it was such a basic question could we have responded to it within, within a couple of minutes, right? Could autopilot would have taken over, right? So in addition to, like I said, you know, what that one element we've added that actually has made a huge difference, right? So I think nothing, no change, you know, to what Prashant and Shavan mentioned, but that additional element uh, is what I think we have seen, uh, you know, actually helps you, uh, you know, create just much better experiences. Got it. I think what uh, you guys are largely saying is that identify the, probably the outcome matrix, which is like, which represents probably your onboarding or which represents your activation or probably the NPS score, whatever you're trying to optimize and identify who are the probably champions on that. And then relook at that cohort and see what are the commonalities that they share in terms of be the user demographics or probably the user psychographic profile, or even I think the support experience or their even behavior on the platform, like as Shravan talked about. And then basically you will be able to identify the vectors which are going to give you the kind of a champion uh, user in the outcome. Uh, I think that's that's a very that's a very fair discussion, and I think that's a very valid point in terms of because a lot of times uh, people get lost in the data in terms of that. Hey, there are hundred variables that I'm looking at now. How much I need to optimize what? And then I think the key focus or the outcomes are driven only when you focus on 
one or two where you can kind of iteratively follow up and take them to actually a final conclusion because at any point of time if you're playing with 100 variables you are actually confusing the developer you are confusing the leadership and probably you are also lost yourself right so i think that's a that's a very uh, good point but i think uh, to understand the onboarding a bit more uh, or even this is the product analytics a bit more right there are there are two kind of matrix that we generally track one is a leading metric and the second is a lagging metric in terms of onboarding is generally a leading metric so can you talk a, a bit about the leading kpis that you track as a part of the onboarding that hey this is basically a indication for me that my user is probably going to convert with me or retain with me so what are those leading metrics that probably you on because conversion is a lagging metric as you all know because it is like so many variables kind of come together to form the conversion yeah so i'll go ahead and i'll i'll take a first crack at it right so essentially you know if if you look at onboarding right so onboarding itself also has you know has multiple legs to it right you know how long did it take for you to let's say complete the onboarding or uh, you know what was the you know what was the delta time uh, to when you know you did your first payment or you know any company that first nudge for that matter right um and uh, and you know and, and over time you know how many you know products have you touched with and how much and how much you have learned about and how much and how much you know data points you have touched the, across the you know the merchant life cycle right so typically you know you know th- these are some of the elements that we track you know from a you know from a leading right from i think from a uh, you know from a lagging point of view i think uh, you know i think the the business health is typically what you track right but i think almost everybody tracks it in the business we looking at in terms of you know the number of active merchants you have on the base the number of dollars that you process the number of transactions you onboard right uh the the other leg you know which i think uh, you know it's fairly critical you know from a lag metric in terms of you know your uh, your your uh, brand value on social media right i think uh, that is one thing that i, I at least i have learned in india right i think even even globally for that matter that uh, what is the your what's the, what is your brand perception on social media right i think right now uh, you know uh folks on social media can be extremely brutal and you have to do whatever it takes to protect it which means that uh, the only way you can do it is to kind of create the right experiences right so you know we track we track that you know very we track that you know, you know very closely the kind of you know issues we are facing and the kind of problems we are facing and, and that is also one of the and that is also you know you know one of the uh, you know is, is what we call you know what, is what we call experience index is what experience index is you know what is our you know is is on week on week or month on month you know brand value on social media across all the channels you know twitter linkedin uh, twitter linkedin facebook be more you know instagram not so much uh, but some challenge right so these are some of the metrics we track in addition to typically you know the business metrics we track yeah, yeah. so so I mean, go ahead prashant yeah please yeah, please please sure yeah. go ahead so uh, from our side specifically as we talked about i think identifying the right metrics is really important and from a leading and a lagging metric it's like how many calories do you take and your lagging metric is what's the weight that you've lost right so it's very similar to that right so for us it is typically the tied to the core value prop that we always keep talking about that india's best teachers then the best out resolution and then there are some lagging metrics specific to that but from a leading point is the actual experience like how do you effectively solve a doubt why do you say that it's the best out resolution it can be as as very simple from a from a very small metric that how many doubts do actually get solved in a class or it can be as simple as that that what's the teacher quality rating that happened post class that is the teacher actually doing any good or not or the third part it can be as simple as that uh, what's the watch time percentage what's the what how many how what percentage of students actually attended the class to a certain level so that if i know if i can fine tune these metrics the leading metrics in such a way i know it will have a ripple effect on my nps on my feedback score on my retention cohorts right i know for a fact that okay if personalized sessions and th- these leading metrics also kind of push forward towards some sort of functional insights towards the campaigns like one of the things that we realized for earlier cohorts for earlier grades was that people lower to lower grade students want personalized sessions something like equations or some but on the contrary if you move towards higher grades it can be as generic as five great techniques to crack je it can be as greater as that and that really happened when we really took a stab at the rating score that we had for a teacher that okay and that whether the concept was understood and and there were certain great insights that came out okay the concept was too broad I, he didn't cover polynomials he didn't cover that particular aspect and we understood that across grades the tendency to move towards a more broader element towards the higher grades is really great and we optimized those sessions in such a way that the product offering kind of diversified scaled 
in, in a way from lower grades to higher grades and that really improved my functional teacher rating which fundamentally improved my retention that it brought more people to the platform so go, from a user standpoint we move towards the macro details like if i can give a personalized experience to what nalin is expecting on the platform then more often than not he will come back so you have to go from the micro to the macro details but the micro interactions typically as prashant also spoke about gives you those kind of details and try to help you optimize your leading metrics in such a way that your macro level metrics also kind of hit the score yeah the, i mean i again take a slightly contrary stand like i kind of does not agree with the whole idea of uh, leading and lagging metrics in the sense like um, I agree with the tactical value of all that what you're talking about. Essentially, leading and led, kind of uh, lagging metrics are uh, residual from a time when everything was a transaction-based thing. You know, so if you're running a platform where transaction processing you're facilitating, maybe Razor Pay can rely on that. But uh, there are this le- leading and lagging happens in in a context. So there's there are certain data points which are orthogonal to it. So take payment for example if there is a iphone sale running on and then uh, there is a 10000 rupees uh, discount being offered you know people will go through they will make three time attempt to make a payment three time no matter how slow your payment gateway is but, you know and that orthogonal data point will basically skew your lagging metrics i used to run a um, manage a mobile app um, portfolio and we had like series 40 uh touch and type phone where you have navigate the touch screen via uh, uh arrow keys and all there were so many accidental clicks used to happen and that basically increased our ctr to top and they, that cohort become the highest revenue source for us <laughs> because the worst user experience but highest revenue source uh, so basically you have to see this leading and lagging metrics Uh, in a context and so on the leading side you have to see what are the orthogonal data point which kind of define the user context it is coming from a discount is it coming from novelty am i the only one who is offering uh, this service in the market or the need is so thing in the sense like if you look at retail like physical retail has a conversion rate of around 40% out of 140 people buy something maybe it's a packet of biscuits or like a t-shirt or something but 40% conversion rate and then online retail has 5% or 10% is like awesome like you know so it's context it's not shopping as a need doesn't change uh, it's context on and like razor pay siddharth mentioned on the this time uh, on the other side lagging side there is also an nps and other orthogonal data point which kind of bring it back you can always look at this thing uh, to kind of benchmark and streamline or fine tune your workflows which is good but a product is more than a workflow workflow tomorrow somebody will launch vr ar and some other interface paradigm and your workflow will go out of window means like now in i can tell you as you go to nbus and voice become predominant movement somebody will have to crack the voice payment thing now what are the leading and lagging indicator in that you know so that is mostly workflow is more of a sub, subset of the capability of the medium it's constrained by that but you have to look at these metrics in a whole product life cycle okay. sir i think uh, i agree to that point in terms of that obviously you need to kind of bring in that product context and then in the, that context mm-hmm. there might be some leading and lagging mat- metrics and then as pms we need to use that data with a caution Yeah. That if we are seeing those spikes, hey, why these spikes are there? If we are seeing some kind of uh, degradation, why those degradations are there? Are they probably because of some some uh, money burn mm-hmm. that I have done in the recent past and all of that? Yeah, I mean, um, the like increase in payload of an API can in- impact your mm, conversion on the downstream, and then this can be compensated by the cashback. now <laughs> what are the leading <laughs> there circular matrix going on yeah, there are always, you know? uh, and then some day jio can launch a wi fi wi fi for everybody and everything will go up now yeah. it does it necessarily increase it tells you anything about the underlying product 
Uh, probably not. I think I agree that there might be a lot of outliers on the way, and that's why probably data cleaning is something that is always kind of recommended. And then obviously, when you're talking about a context, when the environment changes, the context automatically changes. So, uh, completely agree on that point of view, and obviously that serves as a caution for the listeners as well. So, I think before kind of wrapping up the session, just want to have a flyer question from you guys in terms of like how we have seen the ecosystem changing. Initially, it was all about sales then it came to marketing to generate that demand and now it has probably come to product product is in built kind of having the product growth loops right or the uh, product is actually driving the growth instead of probably marketing doing the ads all the time the product is itself having those virality loops or growth loops right so just just a flyer here that how do you guys see uh, product led growth what key trends that you see in probably the year ahead So, so yeah. I'll take a I'll take a first crack at it, right? So, uh, you know, I think uh, generally what I've seen, right? I think uh, uh, as you rightly mentioned, I think the the co ownership of some of the charters and goals. I think marketing product team. I think I've started to work a lot more closer together than probably what was earlier, right? I think those fairly I think fairly independent roles earlier. Uh, at least now we have seen that. Uh, instead of marketing, you know, being a horizontal function, you know, serving, uh, you know, whether it's you know offline, online, or you know various start various initiatives that drive, right? Typically, if you have like a product BU, typically has a marketing function as part of the BU, right? So, uh, which means that you kind of you know you know you know I think co-own some some of the OKRs or metrics or you know goals or visions that you may have. That is, I think, is one trend that I've seen that's worked. the uh, in, in terms of you know product led growth right product led growth i think one trend as i think has been working and essentially i think will only will we will only have to kind of you know uh, grow further is this entire try and buy right i think this try and buy you know was kind of started with uh, you know freemium model uh, you know of you know if you have to you get gana you get savan you look at all these ott platforms right or even netflix the matter right that that 30 day free campaign you know is is a great hook to get you in right because they want you to experience the product now slowly we're seeing this try and buy even kind of coming into your other consumer products right? i think we've seen you know even even some clothing brands as well are looking to you know looking at try and buy because you know the why is go go keep the clothes for a couple of weeks you try it if you like it keep it if you don't try, if you don't like it you go and return it back right so th- i think the entire concept of freemium is now gone into like this try and buy approach right um and uh, 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 you know i think that is one that i think uh, you know we'll have to kind of ensure that uh if you want to provide the product like growth then you have to you know keep that trend in mind uh that how do you ensure that you know you get them to try the product with as less friction as possible uh you know because that's the only way for you only way for them because you can put a lot of messages out there ki i am this i am that you know this is what i've done for you know 10 more customers but until they experience it you know your ability to get them to the hook is going to be very very small uh the 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 other trend i think is going to work uh, i think in india right uh i think generally if you look at just the content consumption right you have a lot more you know customers consuming content or just generally interacting on mobile you know is is extremely high right you know you have uh, you know your folks who actually are consuming content mobile before they even get their hang on a laptop or a computer for that matter right and 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 the at the age you are consuming content is much much lesser than what was you know you probably i think i remember i got my first mobile at the age of 21 i believe uh and i'm pretty sure that age right now is probably uh below 15 maybe even lesser for that matter right so i think you have to kind of you know ensure that whatever products you create right has to be that 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 mobile first right you have to get that, that focus in mind uh and you have to deploy all the tech in the place to ensure that content consumption in a mobile is there so i think those are two trends that we are banking on and i think we've seen enough indicators um and i'm pretty sure the next couple of years you know these two trends uh, you know will be here to stay so uh, from my stand point what i think functionally is one part that siddharth uh, kind of spoke about i think experiment design is very key i think prashant was also talking about the same thing the context that experiment design will become a very generic function like it is not necessarily related to product or data science i think that will be the throughput that will happen across the ecosystem and people will start thinking like product that how do you design an experiment how do you take a particular cohort how do you look at a particular traffic site so i think that data science and ex- better experiment design is going to be very critical to how we how you drive innovation across multiple cohorts that's the word. the second part that i think that's also spoke about was the content consumption part that as with the advent of internet i think video is going to be 
extremely extremely uh, like how you specifically bring the user give the value uh, to the user without even him going into the product and having those those commitments that he has to make in order to engage with the product and the third and the most critical trend which i think is very relevant is that customer success is going to become very paramount is going to be extremely paramount right i think that is one way through uh, through which uh, Uh, brands like Razorpay or Byju's, or for that matter, any other great brand, has uh, made headway in the future. But I think this will become a normalized trend. Everybody would try to give the best customer success. That's not really going to be a differentiator going forward. I think once we reach to that particular standpoint, I think then deeper things will come into picture, like personalization and data becomes the data is the new oil that we kind of keep talking about. So I think the three trends that I would definitely speak about is one is experiment design is going to be very throughput in the company the second part would be that i think this is going to permeate across and video is going to take the way take the shape and i think as india is digitizing video is going to be the next big trend and the third part is customer success is going to be very normalized i think every brand would try to move towards the best customer success, success experience and that is where the new innovation will kind of lead towards product led growth yeah thanks shavan prashant any contrarian views on this <laughs> <laughs> so that's the last part i'm supposed to no i'm totally again i see the thing is devil always in the detail so i keep hearing about video and i kind of agree with that but uh, see the thing is okay now let me take a step back we in india never had a product made for india so far yeah we had a product retrofitted to indian audience because something was working in us and uh, no we might speak english with little accent but the thing is a uh, person in gurgaon is as computer savvy as a person in san francisco so you can take a uber flow from there and retrofit it to this thing you know so first 50 million and all the series a series b tak you manage then the problem start coming so you basically stretch another 100 150 million by cashback and incentivizing and then you basically hit what they call the nbu next billion and all that's where the real product for india will be made hmm. you know and there is no precedence for that so we can all speculate in the comfort of our tier one houses but uh, nobody has done that so far pawn sites have done it pretty good in that sense but uh, other than that if you look at the video consumption pattern there is nothing because the problem is uh, especially you look at uh, transaction sites and all that. people keep saying video video as if video is a preference video is never a preference video was a constraint because people video is the only medium where there is no literacy barrier okay nbu constitute a lot of people who have no literacy so if you have to sell to next billion user through video talking of like commerce side for example like you know so that medium is the only medium left to them which is two way and it has no literacy barrier so what kind of a U, ux you will which will work you can project a product demo on a video but how will you capture the feedback maybe by you know or you might have to flash a 1800 numbers like you know tele shopping loop you know or you have like you know two red bulb kind of a button say bye 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 you know or you have to kind of facilitate that thing by uh, putting some celebrity so that's uh, it that's the biggest learning we'll have in next 5 to 10 years and it's it'll take 10 year before it kind of stabilizes its cash on delivery is still major chunk so it take 10 year before the cash on delivery kind of we learn how to do so it will take similar amount of time i think uh, that's a that's a very nice take on the ecosystem in terms of that the ecosystem is kind of maturing and i think you rightly pointed out that uh, after probably hitting the first 100 150 million users mm-hmm. they're probably internet first in india mm-hmm. all the companies had the stumbling block hey how mm-hmm. do you reach to that middle of the pyramid or the bottom of the pyramid mm-hmm. i think uh, the problem also is uh, the way we think all of mm-hmm. most of us think in the eco chambers with which kind of we have kind of grown up as well the education or the kind of place we have lived or the lifestyle that we have the people we hang out with mm. i think that also brings in that uh, kind of eco chamber and i think yeah uh, the products as well as the company or the product managers have to push in those boundaries and probably learn more about those consumers who are going to be the next wave and probably create the products for the nbu or india specific product i would say learning curve hota hai everything has a learning curve even your users has a learning curve sometimes see the point is the kind of companies 
uh, who will be addressing that market they have already saturated the metro market and they might probably be funded in the upward of 100 million so they can always offset that difficulty of learning by running a campaign on tv yeah. <laughs> you know so product managers can take all the credit they want but it's the tv campaign which is bringing them or a full center fold in newspaper and all you will be surprised uh, how the metrics improve by center fold in newspaper <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting question. I'll probably go back and see if there are any questions that people may have. Sandeep, uh, any ideas if we have any question here? Then we just have one. I think you guys have taken it up already <laughs> from Maniket Patil. Awesome. I think this, this question is kind of a bit uh, kind of different from the topic that we were discussing. But I guess the, there are people who can obviously add value to uh, this question. So I think uh, the question from Aniket is that all information is fantastic. However, any tips for newbie or a fresher who is looking to make a career into product management in terms of project and profile building? Just probably take a shot at it, whosoever wants. What's the question? Uh, how, how a newbie can make a transition into a product management career? From an existing that, functional proximity or a totally new? I think that detail we are missing, but... Uh, Take a dig at it with you. I think other. I would assume, uh, uh, I would say a fresh up probably. Never been to in that function. Yeah, he has been to the new, so. I mean, start using product, I believe, and then applying the first principle based thing. Yeah. I mean, you yeah, see the problem is most of the time, the question is uh, how to be a good product manager. The answer is different and how to get past the HR. And if you have no prior product experience is a different answer. So, you know, if it is how to get past as an HR is the thing, then probably work as an intern at some startup and get that in the resume. There's a two different problem. Getting past the HR is a different problem than actually being a product manager. So, which is, so I don't know what the gentleman or the lady want to know about. Yeah, yeah I think he's, he's, he's totally new to the function and then he wanted to check. How yeah. does he get into it? Yeah, I think as uh, Prashant completely mentioned, I'll also take a dig at it because I'm also a product manager by, yeah. by the way. So yeah, I think uh, Prashant mentioned right on point in terms of completely depends on your context. And I think you can probably start with making those internships and probably make an internal transition into the same company. And once you have some kind of product management experience, then probably look out to switch because a lot of companies try to hire P, uh, PMs who have some latter kind of experience rather than probably entry-level PMs. But then you can also look out at the companies who are hiring the entry level PMs. There probably you would be at the same uh, foundational level in terms of whosoever else is applying, right? So I think these are the for certain paths that I also see. I think there is another question here where on the chat. Yeah. There is on China, some questions on China. Yeah, yeah. if you, yes. I think the this chat. question is, uh, I'm not sure what exactly is the context, but I think they are uh, probably trying to understand that isn't China be a close approximation to India and wouldn't the products built in China probably will have so much resemblance to product built in India or vice versa? This will be, I spent a bit of my time in China, in Hangzhou. Uh, so yeah, there are certain, I, I did a thread on Twitter, you can check about what are the things happening in China, which might kind of extrapolate to Indian market also. So yeah, uh, there are a lot of similarity. Uh, uh, People are somewhat, so there are certain problem which has been solved in China. For example, identity as a problem has been solved. There's a centralized identity available. Yeah. The, the comfort with payment is very high, yeah. you know? So the, that's their video is pretty, they have gone through that learning of videos. So that's there. So yeah, how do you basically offset for that uh, prior learning? You know, uh, right now we have, uh, have, it took us like some 2000, uh, like less than four or five years and the Indian has started to use uh, QR code. Now there is very famous Alan Zong quote. I kind of always remember that. What was the search for desktop web search box? Mm -hmm. QR code will be for the mobile web now, but we haven't really seen uh, QR code as ubiquitous in India as China. So I think there will be some thing which can be picked up and some we will have to kind of adapt for uh, like um, Indian context. Like uh, people are very homogeneous over there in the sense like, yeah. uh, uh, so in India it's very diverse in terms of language and all. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, to adding to adding to that point that what Prashant mentioned, I think from a learning standpoint, also from the education ecosystem, if you see that India never really scaled as a live learning model. It was it was very difficult to transcend that model because of the internet penetration that India had. But China, on the contrary, had had very deep internet penetration penetration long back before India had. So I think the innovation in that particular sphere that where live and Synchronous and asynchronous content is going to come together, and it's going to be a blended model, which is very popular in China. There, I know companies in China which do over five hundred million dollars in revenue, specifically on this common model that they have. That in a live class, you might have twenty minutes of live experience, and then you have a gamified experience around it. Right? It takes care of the depth of penetration of internet as well as the kind of. closed closed holistic experience that you want to drive that is something that we that will get imbibed but not really and that is why as of now at least that i'm talking about that is why we see independent business models coming in edtech and they will eventually merge together like doubtnet was one model that we talked about which is a doubt resolution model but going forward as india deepens in internet penetration 4g penetration becomes more and more accessible i think that is something as a cumulative behavior we will also move towards that synchronous learning kind of a structure that 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 gets built that is one follow up that i see from the education industry per se yeah see may i add one more interesting point to this so to this the model which uh, shravan is mentioning is like uh, synchronous and all this is a subset of a wider trend which is called second screen experience essentially where you are watching something on the tv and then you are also basically doing uh, uh, like playing a game on top of it like you know so uh, this manifest in uh, education in this way there are uh, like social shopping site where you are watching video and also placing order yeah. on the live stream like pindio duo so in yeah. shopping it kind of manifest in a different way it will manifest in entertainment in different ways so you know you have to basically take any pattern and say okay how will it translate to my country as well as my industry in specific so there will be a lot of variation yeah yeah i think uh, in the interest of time and i think uh, the panelists will also have to kind of uh, have to kind of uh, go back to the important things so mm-hmm. i'll probably wrap up this conversation it was really a enriching session for at least me and i'm sure that it would have added a lot of value to the listeners as well thank you prashant siddhat and shravan for taking out time today and spending it with us and helping you this to kind of understand more about product data onboarding and probably nbu and china and india i think uh, that has been really helpful for everyone of us thanks a lot thank you